Uh, Luke chapter 9 is where we'll be at this morning, verses 46 through 50, with a sermon titled, The Sin of Superiority. As Dr. Virtue said a little few moments ago, Pastor, I'm excited for the sermon, but I'm not excited for the sermon, because he knows what's ahead. Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through 50, The Sin of Superiority. There are many deadly and lethal poisons to avoid in this life, among which a very prominent one, carbon monoxide, is known as the silent killer because it's undetectable by the human senses. There are many devastating poisons that you can ingest or breathe in that can bring much harm to the physical body, even cause death. But there's one silent killer which is more dangerous than all of these. While most toxins begin outside the body, work their way into the body, and can cause major harm and even death, the most dangerous of all of these is the one that lives within each of us, works its way out, and does damage and harmful effects to those around us. This silent killer has taken down many friendships, many marriages, many families, many churches, governments, and even entire nations, and no one is immune to its work. All lie at risk. The Bible refers to it as pride. Pride is the most dangerous poison known to man. And if you think I'm exaggerating for a moment here, think of it for a second. Physical poison, yes, can kill the body. But pride kills the soul for all of eternity. It was pride, after all, for which Lucifer fell from heaven It was pride that caused Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit and then cast all of mankind after Adam into a sinful human state. And we are dealing even today with all of the broken ramifications of their pride to this day. Everything broken in our world today is because of pride. If you don't think pride is a big deal, I've heard it before. I know it's an issue but there are other bigger problems, then you've already fallen victim to its trap. Because Scripture says clearly, take heed lest you fall, because pride goes before the fall. Pride went before the fall in the garden, and it goes before every fall into sin. For every single sin, find its roots in pride, thinking you know better than God. Sin can take many forms, but it always forms from pride within the heart. Pride has differing effects within our areas of lives, but it primarily affects how we view ourselves and also, in turn, how we view those around us. We think higher of ourselves than we should and therefore think lesser of those around us. Now, this attitude of superiority is not pleasing to God, nor is it fitting of those who are heavenly citizens walking here on earth, and we'll see this unfold in our passage this morning. So as we approach Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through 50, we see that pride is not an acceptable attitude in the kingdom of God. We'll see this in two ways in which pride distorts our attitudes and mindset. It first distorts your attitude of yourself, and then in turn your attitude towards others. So let's first look at verses 46 through 48. Pride distorts your attitude of yourself. Luke writes, then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thoughts of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. Now, don't forget what happened last week, which is just the day of in this passage still. There was a demon within a young boy, and the disciples failed to remove this demon. They failed in what they were supposed to do. And so right after this lesson of utter failure and Jesus' teaching of urgency to develop faith and trust and dependence on him, these same disciples turn and are walking now with Jesus towards their next destination, arguing about which of them is the greatest. I mean, you can't make this up. Only such a fallen human condition of sin can produce such pride, which makes a person goes from utter failure, then thinking within 24 hours that they are the greatest. But that's the situation that we find in our text. 
The disciples are traveling along the road with Jesus. Their next destination in an argument, a dispute arises between them. It's over who of them is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Now, how did this argument come about? We don't know. It could be that the other disciples were jealous of Peter and James and John. They get to go up on the mountain to have this special alone time with Jesus and the other disciples were left behind. I don't know if Peter, James, or John maybe could have been bragging about the life-changing experience that they had on top of that mountain. The text doesn't give us the details of that dialogue, but we do know the sinful nature of mankind. And it's easy to see how a situation just like that develops in this text, knowing the tendency of our own hearts. You see, the disciples were still under this false notion that the kingdom of God was coming now. This is where, why Peter wanted to stay on that mountain. He thought the kingdom of God was being ushered in now through the transfiguration of the Son of God. This is why the disciples rejected that there would be any sort of suffering or death to the king. No, because that would mean the kingdom can't come right now. And so as the, they thought the kingdom was being ushered in quickly, they wanted to make sure that they got the positioning and the pecking order right before the kingdom came. Now, before we get too critical of them, we we do have to understand and step into the culture of their day. Because everything in their culture was based on position, honor, and authority, and respect. Everything from where you sat and what you did in the house of worship, all the way to your seat at mealtime, was governed by your position, governed by your status. And you were treated with the same respect and authority as your position deserved and required. It was ingrained in them. It went from greatest to least in every single event and everyone knew with clarity where they were on the pecking order. But even though this was ingrained in their culture, it doesn't make it an acceptable attitude before God. We have to keep in mind, God doesn't adjust his kingdom mentality to our cultures and preferences. We must adjust our mentality of the fittings according to the kingdom of God in which he says in his word. And so the text tells us in verse 47 that Jesus knows what's taking place within their hearts. He's walking a little bit of ways in front of them. Mark's account leads us to believe that. And Mark's account also tells us that once they got to their destination, Jesus asks them, what is it that you were arguing about back on the road? Now, Jesus' omniscience, knowing all things, discerning the hearts of all the crowds many times in the Gospel of Luke so far, does the exact same thing with the disciples. He knows what the issue is, but he wants them to say it. Face it. He saw through their exterior shell to the disciples' hearts of bitterness, of jealousy, a pride and superiority which was beneath the surface. And now you can start to understand why Jesus was so frustrated last week uh, about their failure, that they, their lack of development in faith. They, they weren't urgent enough to develop this dependent faith on him because they're too busy worrying about themselves and what they think they're deserving of in the coming kingdom of God. So Jesus is again going to have to correct and adjust their mentality and mindset as to what his kingdom requires. And to do so, he brings a child from nearby, sits him right next to him. Now we read this as 2023 readers and say, oh, that's nice. Children are sweet, innocent, kind. But again, step back into their culture. A child was the lowest position in the world at that time. Until age 13, where they can really be taught the Torah and the understandings of the law and be held responsible to contribute to society, well, those ages 12 and under were really considered a waste of time. They, they just existed, but that's all they did because there, there's nothing that they could contribute. So they were more of a nuisance. They were more of a hindrance as they were the lowest in the latter society at the time. So for Jesus to associate with a child is to make such a dramatic statement. It would be as if Jesus brought a homeless person from on the street and sat him next to him as a teaching example. But what he would tell him next in verse 48 is even more shocking. He says this, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you all will be great. Total opposite of what they had thought and what they were expecting. Total, complete reversal of who they thought and what it took to be the greatest in God's kingdom was totally different than what they expected. 
But as Jesus uses a child as this illustration and example in the text, it really is meant to teach them two things about the kingdom of God. One about dependence on the king himself, Jesus, and the other is about humility and association with others in the kingdom. If we jump over to Matthew 18, a parallel passage of this, verses 3 or 4, shows us of that dependence, where Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Remember, what were they just rebuked of in the previous passage? For having such little faith, little dependence on Christ, but total, complete confidence in themselves. And Jesus assures them that unless you come into him with this dependence and faith and trust of a little child, there's no entrance in the kingdom at all. Here they're worrying about their positions in the kingdom and who was to come and which order they would be in when Jesus clarifies that such an attitude of superiority is not even allowed to enter his kingdom to begin with. But this example of a child also is meant to teach them that of humility. Associating and receiving and caring for the lowly. You see, dependence on God will ultimately result in an attitude of humility and recognizing that you are not truly better than anyone else, even a child in the lowest levels of society. Would you be so humble as to receive this child into your care? To care for them, to love them, to extend it to them when they can do nothing whatsoever to return it to you. And so Jesus was teaching that if if they truly want to be great in the kingdom of God, they first need to humble themselves to be servants in the kingdom of God now. Mark 9, 35, the other parallel text that we're in this morning says, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. But you see, this is such a different mindset than their world at the time, but it's not much farther than our world we live in today. Think of leadership structures in our world. Think of businesses and corporations and those who ascend the ladders of leadership. Those who are the ones who do that have a bold and daring personality, assert themselves, usually run people over to accomplish what they want, using people left and right to advance their program, advance their vision and their dreams. But Jesus says, leadership in God's economy, in God's kingdom, if you want to be the greatest leader, you are the servant of all. But Jesus isn't asking them to do anything that he is not already doing currently with them. If you recall the beginning of Philippians 2, where we're taught that, that, that the Son of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God in the heavenly position on the throne, but set it to the side for a season in humility, descended to the ranks of mankind to become in the likeness of human flesh, to live a life of obedience and sacrifice his life on that cross for them. Complete humiliation, humbling to the lowest. And so Jesus was simply calling his followers to be like him. After all, that's what a follower of Christ is to be, to model their life and follow in the examples of the Savior who they claim to follow. So Jesus was simply calling his followers to be like him, just as he calls us to do the same today, to be like him in his humility. Because the truth is, those who have been saved by grace by Jesus Christ, and it's nothing that they have done in their own strength, should be the most gracious and humble individuals on planet Earth. They've been given everything, and they've earned none of it. But what often happens is that those who have received so much grace like this, because of the knowledge that they've been given, because of the access to truth that they now have, And the insight they're given, they see what they have and the world doesn't. And it builds this arrogance. It builds pride. It builds this mindset of superiority. That we're better than everyone else. Because we have the insight. And therefore, you can in turn act better than others. 
This is what's going to take place in the text next. The disciples' prideful attitudes of themselves don't just affect their own view of themselves and a misunderstanding of how God's kingdom operates, but it's also going to in turn affect their view of others as followers of Christ as well. So we continue in verse 49 and 50. We see pride distorts your attitude of others. Right after this account, now John answered and said, Master... We saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now John, we're understanding from this text, he's starting to soften. You might even say he's starting to be convicted, because he raises his hand and says, Jesus, What about this situation? Did we act wrongly here? A situation comes up that perfectly exemplifies this attitude of humility that Jesus was just teaching on. It falls right into this lesson on pride and humility. There's a man casting out demons in the area, but the disciples forbade him to do so. Why? Because he wasn't one of the twelve. Now, the text doesn't tell us. How is it that he received power to do that? Very interesting question you can raise. The text doesn't tell us, so we don't know. But he was successful in removing demons through the power of God. So it wasn't an issue of who he was following, but simply because he was not associated with the 12 disciples. It was not an issue of his belief and understanding as God. He's not trying to remove them or exercise them based on a, another deity or another name, but that of God. But it wasn't good enough for the disciples. If it's not one of us, if it's not a part of the club, it doesn't happen. And with this arrogance and this superiority and pride comes this jealousy and exclusivity. And we find here with such a response. Their attitude of pride really clouded their judgment. They weren't just misunderstanding themselves and their level of importance and authority in the kingdom of God, but they also misunderstood and misrepresented other people, especially other followers of God and what they're doing. And they thought, if it's not our way, they have to be stopped. And is this not such a needed word for us today in the modern church? For we are so quick to judge and condemn others if they don't Do ministry just like us. One writer way back in the 1800s wrote these words that could have been penned yesterday. He says, thousands in every period of church history have spent their lives in copying John's mistake. They have labored to stop every man who will not work for Christ in their way from working for Christ at all. They have imagined in their petty self-conceit that no man can be a soldier of Christ unless he wears their uniform and fights in their regiment. They have been ready to say to every Christian who does not see everything with their eyes, forbid him, forbid him, for he follows not with us. So many splits, so many divisions are everywhere under the banner of Christianity. And we really have a much needed lesson here from our Savior to not be of that same mindset of superiority and attitude for others who name the name of Christ, even if they do things a little bit differently than we do. Just because we do things differently doesn't make us more insightful, doesn't make us more superior than anyone else in value or work within the kingdom of God. Yes, we are operating by our convictions of what we believe the Bible teaches, and others are doing the same on believing the best in that. They're just doing it differently, coming to different conclusions. But we need to be careful to not take this account too far the other direction, to insert details which are not present in that text. Must we join and partner in others who are doing their work? No. Notice Jesus doesn't tell the disciples to go and help him, to partner with him in this work. He doesn't say bring him in so he can join the ranks with us and we'll connect together with this. No, Jesus says, let him be, for he's doing good work. It's done in my name and leave him alone to keep doing that. You see, these verses, some could easily take this to teach a form of widespread ecumenism, which really means linking arms with just anybody who names the name of Christ, no matter what they believe or what they hold to. It's a popular movement in our time, which really sacrifices truth on the altar of unity. 
But when we come to read the scriptures, we come to understand there's no unity without truth. For every group, every single association has some core convictions, values, and belief systems that they hold on to, that keeps the participants together. But the broader your partnerships go, the less you will ultimately agree on, meaning the more that you compromise on beliefs and values that you believe the Bible teaches. But keep in mind that while we might not agree with every minor doctrine and practice of other churches and ministries in the areas, there are many churches and ministries doing good and faithful work in the kingdom of God. And we must not have this attitude of superiority. If they're not doing everything like us, then they're lower than us and lesser than us. We must be thankful and rejoice that God is raising up and using so many different people and likenesses, brothers, sisters in Christ, to do good work uh, in this world of sharing the gospel, of fighting against sin in this world, of pulling down strongholds of Satan, even if they're not doing it the same way that we would. We need a lesson from the Apostle Paul's attitude in Philippians 1, 15 through 18, where he says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill, The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my change. They had wrong motives in why they're preaching Christ. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, that Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Paul could have easily said, If they're preaching Christ with the wrong motivation, forbid him. Motives matter. Yes, the Bible teaches that. But Paul had this attitude that nevertheless Christ was being preached. And in that he rejoices. And we too should rejoice when these good things are happening here in this world for the kingdom of God. And don't think lesser or indifferent of others when they do things differently. Or align differently in their methods and associations than we would. Because if we do that we fall into the same sin as the disciples here. For that's what Jesus is stressing to the disciples in this passage. He's addressing their attitude and mentality towards others in the kingdom of God. Their pride has not just distorted their view of themselves, but has also in turn affected their view and distortion of others. So Jesus uses this. Example is a a teaching moment to teach this humility and affirm the attitudes and mentality that he requires for those in his kingdom. The lesson is this, there are no all-stars in his kingdom except for God. There are no untouchables in God's kingdom except for God the creator. There are none greater than others except for God the creator. There is God and there are his citizens. All are equal in value and worth that he's given them to do. None are superior than others in worth or value before God. So stop thinking this way towards others who are doing good in the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling them, rebuking them really, to not have such a mindset of superiority simply because you're in the 12 and he's not. There's only one boast we should have. Not in any association, but Galatians 6.14. Paul says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. There is only one that we boast in. There's only one that we find all of our pride and confidence in. There is only one that is superior to all us, and it's Christ and Christ alone. We don't pride ourselves in ourselves, but we pride ourselves in Christ who is the one in us. We glory in the Lord. He must increase. We must decrease. But pride, this sin of superiority is such a rampant and devastating issue because it affects every single person on planet earth. Therefore, we have to take extra measures, extra cautions, extra considerations in how we apply this passage to our lives today. Because it's not good enough just to understand, yeah, I've got some pride. No, we have to understand that everyone is guilty of the sin of pride and superiority. See, if your first thoughts 
when you've heard uh, the truth of God's word in this specific passage. This sin of pride, this sin of superiority. If your first inclination was to think of somebody else and how they need this, you've just demonstrated with full clarity that you are overlooking your own sin and looking towards the pride and superiority of others. If your first thought is, I hope my husband's listening to this. If your first thought is, ah, why aren't they here this morning? This is what they needed. Or yes, this is exactly where our church is at. This is what they need to hear. You're showing with clarity that pride also is clouding your own judgment because you're seeing everyone else's faults and failures before your own. And the more you come through the scriptures and you read the Bible and understand what pride is, the more the question is not just do you have pride in their life, but how much and where is it hiding beneath the surface that you're totally oblivious to? Because due to our sin nature, everyone has pride. You're simply blind to it, but can see it clearly in others. So to, to bring and to clear the fog of self-righteousness, our, our good friend Stuart Scott has put a little booklet together called From Pride to Humility. And within that booklet, he gives just this long list of manifestations of pride and what it looks like in our lives. Here are some ways in which it's demonstrated in your life. Pride looks like complaining against God, lacking gratitude in your life, anger, seeing yourself as better than others, having an inflated view of your importance, gifts, and abilities, being focused on the lack of your gifts and abilities. Pride looks like perfectionism, talking too much, talking too much about yourself, seeking independence or control, being consumed with what others can think, being devastated or angered by criticism, being unteachable, being sarcastic, hurtful, or degrading. It looks like a lack of service, a lack of compassion, being defensive or blame-shifting, a lack of admitting when you are wrong, a lack of asking forgiveness, a lack of biblical prayer. Pride resists authority and is disrespectful. It voices preferences or opinions when not asked. It looks like minimizing your own sin and shortcomings and maximizing others' sin and shortcomings. It's being impatient or irritable with others, being jealous or envious, using others, being deceitful by covering up sins, faults, and mistakes, and seeking to draw attention to yourself through actions, conversations, how you dress, etc. How are we doing? Feeling real good, right? If you're feeling convicted, good. Do not suppress it. Do not justify it. Do not explain it away. Satan wants nothing more than for you to think pride isn't that big of a deal because that's where he attacks you because he knows our human nature. Sin is such a big deal against God and we cannot suppress it. We cannot hide it. Consider just a brief survey of especially Proverbs and what the Bible teaches about pride to understand the severity of the issue at hand. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. New Testament, James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's not all scripture says, but you, you starting to understand the perspective. You should be understanding the severity of which the scriptures explicitly say. There are very few things that says that God hates, but pride is one of them, and it tops the list. Why does God oppose and resist pride so much? Because pride is at the root of every sin. Pride says, I don't need God. I can act my own way. Pride is the worship of self. It was pride that caused Satan's fall. 
It was pride for which Eve and Adam took that first bite, and it's pride whenever you choose to live according to yourself rather than according to your God. At the heart of every sin known to man is pride, and we all have it. The question is, how much is there? But the Bible doesn't just speak about the devastating dangers of pride and superiority but it also supplies the only solution that can fight against it in this life. There's hope this morning. Yes, you should feel the conviction of your pride and your sinfulness. I would honestly be worried and concerned if you didn't. But take note and understand, the solution this morning is not just to get out of this mess yourself because, in fact, you and your pride got yourself into this mess. But it's only God and His grace through His gospel that can bring you out. So secondly, we have to understand the gospel brings us to God where we can truly find forgiveness of sin and the righteousness of Christ which is required to break the chains of sin and death, to walk then in newness of life according to a new pattern of the Spirit of God. Take comfort if you're convicted of sin this morning. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, including pride. This is, after all, why Christ came to live and to die in our place so that we can be forgiven of sin and brought back into fellowship with God where we can then first time live in accordance to the godly standard which he's called us to live all along. For 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. You see, the only way to remove the, the filth of pride is to get your eyes off of yourself and look to your Christ who exemplified with perfection what humility totally looks like. Look to his character, an example of humble ways through his life in the Gospels. Understand and reflect on the gospel of which he's given his life in full humility so that you no longer have to obey your sinful lusts and desires and pride from within. But you no longer have to let sin reign in your mortal bodies. But you can, by God's grace, through his spirit, actually put to death the sin that lies within. It's only by renewing your mind in the gospel and in the character of God that pride will melt away as you focus on the Savior. Consider James 4, 7 through 10. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and then and only then he will lift you up. But notice the text. You do not lift yourself up. Pride lifts itself up. But only God can lift you up. But what's the requirements? To submit to him, which takes humility. Resist Satan and his enticements that you are enough in yourself. That you can find happiness within. That to go your own way is to go the path of joy and pleasure. Resist. Stay away. Draw near to the only one who can help you out of the sinful state of pride and superiority. But James 4 also says we need to treat our sin and see it as he sees it. Lament your sin. Weep because of your sin. Don't laugh, don't rejoice in your sinfulness, but be broken of it. More and more, what's taking place in modern Christianity is a lower view of sin and a higher view of self. We have lost the severity of sin. But Scripture is clear. It's to be lamented on to be mourned and broken over. And just as the prayer last week, 
God, I believe, help me in my unbelief. A similar prayer could be said, God, I'm sorry for my sin, but make me sorrow even more. Being broken and crushed over the sin that caused your Christ to pay for it. Because there's no sin that is so light which caused the Son of God to be punished on that cross. That moves us to sorrow, it moves us to brokenness, and it moves us to humility that all we are good for is to sin. But God in His grace doesn't leave us in the depths of despair. But for those who are truly crushed in spirit, humbled and broken over their sin, confessing it to Him, He picks them up and exalts them, all to show His infinite love, His infinite kindness, His grace, and His mercy. So humble yourself this morning in repentance and faith, and God will forgive your sins and exalt you as the humble. Thirdly, what takes place next? Because of Christ, you can put off the pride and begin cultivating and putting on attitudes and habits of humility. Because you see, if you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you can be set free from the demands of sin, meaning you no longer have to obey sin's enticements. You can now obey God and live in according to righteousness, which you've always been called to live. But to do this, you have to look to Christ first and walk as he walked, following his example, renewing your mind in the word of God, walking in humility. Consider Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness, synonym for humility, and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. How do you do this? Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but there again, in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What does walking in lowliness look like? Well, just as Dr. Stewart saw, gave us a list of what it looks like for pride, he also gives a helpful list of characteristics of humility. What does it look like to have this humility? He writes, to recognize and trust God's character. Seeing yourself as having no right to question or judge the perfect God. It looks like focusing on Christ. It looks like giving yourself to biblical prayer and a great deal of it. It looks like being overwhelmed with God's undeserved grace and goodness, being thankful and grateful in general towards others, being gentle and patient, seeing yourself as no better than others, having an accurate view of your gifts and abilities, being a good listener, talking about others only if it's good or for their good, being gladly submissive and obedient to those in authority, preferring others over yourself, being thankful for criticism or reproof, having a teachable spirit, seeking always to build others up, serving in an attitude of likewise serving, a quickness in admitting when you're wrong, a quickness in granting and asking forgiveness, repenting of sin as a way of life, minimizing others' sins or shortcomings in comparison to your own, being genuinely glad and re rejoicing for others, being honest and open about who you are and the areas in which you need to grow. Those are the marks of kingdom citizens of heaven. Those who are humble and lowly in mind. Those who depend on God and His goodness, who treat others with the same kindness and love and compassion which God in Christ has treated us. But this can only come as you recognize, as you repent of, and as you remove the pride in your life. And as you get busy with removing pride, just know, understand where we're at in redemptive history. We are not glorified in perfect likeness with Jesus Christ. We are still progressively being sanctified more into his image, which means that we will not fully be sinless in this life, which means you won't be able to fully remove pride in this life. But we must learn to be watchful and prayerful and to rule over it lest it rules over us. One pastor wrote of this, of all the sins, there is none against which we have such need to watch and pray as pride. No sin is as deeply rooted in our nature. 
It cleaves to us like our skin. It roots never entirely die. They are ready at any moment to spring up and exhibit a most pernicious vitality. No sin is so deceitful. It can even wear the garb of humility itself. It can lurk in the hearts of the ignorant, the ungifted, the poor, as well as the minds of the great, the learned, and the rich. Let a prayer for humility and the spirit of a little child form part of our daily supplications. Take pride seriously. Watch and pray. Mortify the sins of the flesh. Crucify them each and every day. Watch and pray lest this sin of superiority consume you. But God is faithful. He is faithful to help you in this pursuit as you look to him and live according to the ways that he's given as you walk in complete and total dependence on him and walk in humility all of your ways he will help you he will guide you and he will also exalt you in his kingdom let's pray father we do ask that you would help that you would not spare us from the full weight of conviction of our sins this morning God, would you show us with clarity where we have sinned and failed before you today? Father, help us to see sins that we have committed against you and sins of omission that we should have done but didn't do. Father, help us to have an increased sensitivity towards our sin. Give us a burden over our sin. Lord, we rejoice and thank you for the promises of Scripture that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, help us to be a church marked by humility, not thinking of ourselves as better than other churches in the areas because we operate differently, not better than one another because we have positions or insight or knowledge. Father, may we be marked by that virtuous character that it finds every citizen of heaven, that of humility, of love, of graciousness, and gentleness. Father, help us this morning doing this work that only you can do. We're dependent on you to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.